I run a great risk in the session this morning because I'm sure in my heart I'm supposed to look at certain matters critically and to ask you to join me in a critical appraisal of where we're at today. As I've been contemplating for some weeks this occasion and uh, realizing that I have the privilege of speaking twice uh, this morning and then again tomorrow morning, and then reflecting upon our gathering two years ago, it just occurred to me that we somehow, I don't know who proposed the uh, title of this conference, Heart Cry for Revival, but it just struck me that's an incredibly wonderful name for a conference like this. And last year, or two years ago rather, we didn't really uh, deal much with the issue of the heart cry for revival. We had many wonderful things put in front of us two years ago, but it occurred to me that uh, we ought to, at least in part, to focus on the title itself. And so I determined to use the two opportunities given me to speak on that very issue. This morning, the heart cry that earth needs, and then tomorrow morning, Lord willing, the heart cry that God awaits. I was so grateful that uh, Brother Al was led in the direction that he was led in the session this morning. Uh, I have found over the years that sometimes you go to a conference to speak and one speaker's going this way and another speaker's going that way and, and you cry out in your own heart, oh God, where are you? Uh, did these men seek the face of the same God? Uh, did they uh, er, yearn for guidance from the same Holy Spirit? But I'm grateful uh, to observe uh, this week that God thus far has moved us along in one direction. And uh, I'm glad uh, for this opportunity to participate uh, in uh, this stirring, I believe, that the Spirit of God is bringing to us. Now, let me begin uh, by addressing to you uh, a problem that uh, I think we have to realistically face. This nation was founded in the spirit of revival. In the earliest days of the New England colonies, they sought the face of God in revival, and by the grace of God, they experienced incredible revivals long before this nation was established in a formal fashion. The heart cry for revival existed so that in the New England colonies in the 1600s, they were moved upon to cry unto God for gracious outpourings of the Holy Spirit, and he responded to them. Virtually everyone has some awareness of the moves of God uh, in the 1700s, that incredible stirring that began uh, in New Jersey, it appears, under Theodore Jacobus Freilinghausen, the Dutch reform man, and touched uh, the Presbyterians uh, in the log college uh, gatherings and uh, swept through New England under the ministry of uh, Edwards and Whitfield. And uh, that movement, which we've called the First Great Awakening, uh, beginning, as I said, about 1732 and running on wave after wave after wave, uh, until the death of Whitfield in 1770. And then everything was interrupted by the War of Revolution. But by 1792, the burden was back in place for revival. And uh, outbreakings of the Spirit's stirrings uh, began in many parts of the uh, then existing colony and kept on into the 1800s, and indeed 
wave after wave of revival occurring uh, up until 1858-1859. But since then, no national stirrings at all. Some lovely touches of the Holy Spirit, some sweet and precious things, for instance, in 1904, 1905, uh, as a spillover from uh, the great revival in Wales, there were parts of this country, especially uh, parts that were heavily populated uh, by people of Welsh descent where there were stirrings, but no national revival since 1859. And have you ever asked why? It seems to me that we are grievously offensive to God when we don't raise the right question. Why did our God so magnificently bless this nation in the 1600s and in the 1700s and in the 1800s? And uh, why has he allowed us to slip into a deep and profound and agonizing decline morally and spiritually since then. Now I know not everyone will agree with what I'm calling wisdom and asking the question why and certainly many will disagree in the answer that I propose. And while it's not my desire to stir up animosities among us, I think we've got to be honest in facing some very critical facts. And even if you feel you must disagree, I want to warn you in advance, you better know what you're talking about if you disagree with me. <laughs> now, I don't mean by that that I think myself infallible but I know myself to have given more than 50 years of consideration to what I'm saying to you. And don't pop off the top of your head with a rebuke until you've thought through the issues. I've asked the question, why have revivals become so rare in our society? And I'd like to suggest to you Three things, not, not that this covers the whole field, but three things of tremendous consequence. First, about 1826, a Scottish man by the name of Edward Irving, who has been labeled by thoughtful men since then as an enthusiast. I don't know whether you use that term, enthusiast. No, it's not the same idea as enthusiastic. But an enthusiast is a person who has such a high sense of themselves and of their own calling under God that they will not submit their notions to others. They will push ahead with their convictions, whether right or wrong, whether building and constructing for good or whether destroying all. Edward Irving was an enthusiast. He was indeed expelled from his own denomination because of his wild and insane views. But he was captivated by the whole concept of the kingdom of God and began a teaching that has become extremely popular, an interpretation of scripture that moved many, many passages of scripture from passages to be interpreted and applied and prayed over in the here and now, he moved them into a future age. He introduced concepts concerning the return of the Lord and uh, 
related passages, and he gave them a slant that uh, led people to the conviction that we really cannot expect anything great, anything gracious, anything glorious in this age, but the great blessing is to come in a future age. That particular teaching, although censored uh, by the Church of Scotland, nonetheless caught on among many and was widely spread by some who rejected views that Irving held. Uh, uh, just as an aside, uh, one of the uh, excesses of Irving had to do with the use of tongues. He was uh, one of the major proponents of tongue speaking. Well, that was rejected by many who nonetheless accepted his doctrinal emphasis upon uh, the second coming in the millennium age. Now, again, I'm on treacherous ground. You may despise me thoroughly by the time I'm through. Then again, you might determined to get back to the Word of God and to take a position before God that will open up the floodgates of heaven and permit an outpouring of the Spirit of God again. I, I will mention just a couple of names of men who popularized Irving's views uh, on millennialism uh, John Nelson Darby, and then C.I. Schofield, so that the views that were introduced for the first time to the world under Irving have become the predominant views of this generation. Now, now think of the question I put in front of you. Why are revivals so rare? Well, if many of the passages of Scripture that speak about the Spirit of God coming in great power and the kingdom of God building at phenomenal rate and the whole earth coming to bow before our Savior, Redeemer, if they're put off into another age, it has an amazing effect upon prayer for revival. It, 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 it tends to shrivel the heart cry for revival. If, in other words, you come to the conviction that in these last days, things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and still worse, it will profoundly affect your whole life and your whole ministry. And you need to understand that for generations, those generations of which I've spoken, when revival after revival after revival was visited upon the people of God, they had a conviction that God was on the throne and that as long as God was on the throne, there were to be anticipated outpourings of the Spirit of God. Now, we've got multitudes among us who will be angry when revival comes because they have stated absolutely dogmatically that the next event on God's calendar is the end of the world. Now, I am not in a position to say we're not living in the last of the last days. Only our Lord is in a position to speak on that subject. But I am in a position to say there is something grievously wrong in supposing that things are only going to get worse and worse. Why not believe that the power of Christ is as great today as it ever was? And the 
probability of an incredibly wonderful outpouring of the Spirit of God is ours to long for and agonize for and cry unto God for. So the first of the influences that I'm burdened to mention to you, which I believe have led us to this tragic place where we've seen no massive revivals in this nation since 1859. And let me just put in as a parenthesis, because we are exporters, and much of the world is under our influence, It's not only America that has suffered from a lack of revival, but much of the rest of the world has been robbed of the blessing of divine hope in the unfulfilled promises of God by erroneous emphasis in theology. The second thing that I introduce, and it may even be more troubling to some than the first, is that soon after the rise of this Irvingism and then uh, the various cults and sects that uh, came out of that, we had here in America the rise of uh, Finneyism, Charles G. Finney. He was a good man and a godly man. But he had a concept of revival that was grievously in error. He believed that a revival was like a crop. If you plow and plant and cultivate and water, you're bound to have the harvest. But it's not true. Revival is God in the midst of his people. God being God, God doing just exactly what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He cannot be controlled. He cannot be manipulated. He cannot be forced. He does just exactly what he pleases. But many took Finney's views and pushed them to extremes so that now in our so-called Christian land, we have a huge element of professed Christians who believe that we are living in the last of the last days and no revival can be hoped for, indeed ought not even to be prayed for. And then we have another large element that believes we can have revival anytime we want it. And all we got to do is get busy and plant and cultivate and water, as I said, and we'll have it. And then a third era has come on much more recently. The whole era that turns the focus of revival from God to phenomena, to experience. Now, do you follow what I'm saying? We have supposedly some 60 million born-again people in America. Now, that's obviously absurd, but nonetheless, that's the kind of a figure that's given out. But let's just pretend there are 60 million born-again people a big chunk of that figure is uh, made up of those who believe that we're living in the last of the last days and no revival can be hoped for. Another big chunk are in uh, the position that says revival is nothing other than the right use of the right means. Anytime we want a revival, go out and get it. And then a, a third element doesn't know what a revival is or think it has to do with laughter or barking or jerking or some phenomena. And what it boils down to is when a national conference called a heart cry for revival is announced and held 
at Ridgecrest in the year of May 2000, there's a mighty small representation of the church that comes. I'm telling you there's an explanation for why revivals are so rare. And part of our burden must be to utter a heart cry for revival that earth needs. And I want to say to you that what our earth needs is a heart cry for revival that is based upon the promises of the Word of God and that has not given up hope. Let me ask you to turn to the book of Psalms now, I've been grateful for the attention given to the Psalms already this week. But let me read two Psalms together, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree of the Lord. All that the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. But thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise. Now, therefore, O ye king, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they all they indeed that put their trust in him. Now there's a relationship between the two psalms. The reason I've read them together is that they go together. 
Obviously, all you have to do is to glance and see that Psalm 2 is twice the size of Psalm 1. Now, that seems inconsequential, but it's really a fact worth noting. Psalm 2 has four stanzas. Psalm 1 has two stanzas. Psalm 2 ends as Psalm 1 begins. Did you ever notice that? Let me repeat it. Psalm 2 ends as Psalm 1 begins. Well, look at Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And look at how two ends. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. One begins with a beatitude and the other ends with a beatitude. And then it must also be said that Psalm 2 begins as Psalm 1 ends. Notice how Psalm and one ends. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Indeed, it must be said that the same issue is dealt with in each psalm. Psalm 1 comes at it from a personal standpoint, an individual standpoint. The man. Psalm 2 comes at it corporately. It indeed is a picture of the world. And it stands. Now, focusing upon Psalm 2, I mentioned a moment ago there are four stanzas of three verses each. The first stanza portrays man against God. The second stanza, verses 4 to 6, portrays God against man. The third stanza describes God for man. And the last stanza, man for God. Let me give you that again because maybe you didn't catch it. First stanza, Man against God. Second stanza, God against man. Third stanza, God for man. And the fourth stanza, man for God. Now keep in mind my introductory words. There's a reason why revivals have become so rare and why such a small portion of the church has any kind of a heart for revival at all. And I want it understood when I'm talking about revival, I'm not talking about a phenomena or experience. I'm talking about God because revival is God in the midst of his people. And I'm saying to you, there are millions and millions and millions of professed Christians in America that don't even know God has distanced himself from them. And they don't care. Never occurred to them that it's something they ought to be concerned about. So when I say they're not interested in revival, I'm saying they are not interested in the nearness of God. They are content with a God who is distant from them and with whom they have as little to do as is possible. But let's take 
these four stanzas and weigh them as best we can. I won't go into the details about this being a messianic psalm. Uh, anyone who knows their New Testament knows that this psalm is often recited in the New Testament, and indeed it is truly a messianic psalm. But let's take it stanza by stanza. First, why do the heathen rage? Or as another translation puts it, why are the Gentile nations in an uproar? Now, surely uh, everyone uh, here is aware that the heathen do rage against God. We are informed frequently uh, by the world around us uh, that we're uh, out of date, <laughs> that we've lost track of reality. Uh, we're going around pretending there is a great and an awesome God to be feared, and the world says to us, that is sheer nonsense. Uh, God is a figment of your own imagination. Uh, there is nothing to be concerned with in terms of a great and eternal God. It's all in your imagination. Why do the heathen rage? Why are they so sure that uh, there is no God to be concerned with. Why do they imagine, we are asking, verse 1, a vain thing? And uh, surely the world around us does imagine a vain thing. They imagine that it is possible year after year after year to live as if there is no God and never suffer any consequence for their vain imagination. And notice the next line. The kings of the earth take their stand. It's not describing something that happens accidentally. It's describing a conspiracy. They gather together. They band as one. They set their selves against God. There is a determined conspiracy in the world to stamp out Christ and Christianity. And we're all aware of that. We're faced uh, with that kind of a world. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed. Our officials in Washington, D.C. have demonstrated their contempt for God and for God's rule and authority. Now, does that prove that we're at the end of time? Does that suggest that we all ought to run and retreat? Does that suggest that it's all over as far as righteousness is concerned? Well, that is, as I've noted already, the interpretation of many. Look at verse 3. Think of the arrogancy of these words. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Why, many of us are old enough to have lived through all that has happened in terms of casting off the yoke, tearing off the cords. Can you not envision right now in your own mind situations in which you heard people say they would not be chained by this old-fashioned morality. They would not allow any such thing as Ten Commandments to dictate their behavior. They were free men, free to do whatever they pleased. And nobody has any right to interfere or to lay laws upon 
me, they say. It's not just an occasional individual here or there that has taken that stance. But the world has conspired to overthrow the yoke of God and to release itself from any bondage to his moral law. And they feel that in doing so, they have been successful. So they look at us and they sneer and they say, those stupid fundamentalists, those crazy and ridiculous and old-fashioned evangelicals, they aren't smart enough to know they had their day and their day is gone. And some who number themselves with us Believe the world when the world says your day is finished. But look at the next stanza, starting at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens, the one who is enthroned in the heavens, he quakes. He lives in fear. Oh, my whole kingdom is in jeopardy. Oh, what will I do if they get any larger? I'll have to disappear. Oh, no, indeed. He who is enthroned in the heavens laughs. I wonder why we don't laugh with him. In the next line, the Lord shall have them in derision. He himself will scoff at them. It does not matter how many millions join in this conspiracy to overthrow the Lord and his law. He scoffs. He holds them in derision. He doesn't even rise up in agitation. He merely holds his enemies in derision. But then, verse 5, he speaks unto them in his wrath. He rebukes them in his anger. He vexes them with his sore displeasure. And indeed, all those who now laugh at our God will suddenly discover that our God has laughed at them. That indeed, they are not the winners. They are the losers. They are not triumphing. They have their day, but their day is numbered. Our day is not numbered. We don't have a limitation of time. We have, by the grace of God, all eternity to join in the triumphant praises of our exalted, victorious king. But the world doesn't know that. They don't even believe it when we tell them the message. But now we come to the heart of the psalm and the reason I've introduced it to this gathering this morning. Verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The king is already installed on his throne. It's not if somehow the church can be triumphant and somehow stand against all these forces of evil. Christ may be able to mount up on his throne. No, no, no. It is not that at all. He is already installed on his throne. 
But in the light of that, how can we live with such defeat? How can we be satisfied with the notion that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse? God has already triumphed. Why indeed do the heathen rage? Most assuredly, all their acts against God are acts of foolishness. I am reminded of that little parable that Jesus told about two kings going to war. One king looks across at his opponent and he sees the monstrous size of the opposing army and in an act of wisdom he gets a white flag and he runs up the white flag and he sends an ambassador uh, to the other army uh, to request terms of peace. Now when one army surrenders to another army, which army arranges the terms of peace? Not the loser, you can be sure but the victor. And part of the message we need to carry into our world is they are in a battle, not merely that they are going to lose, but a battle that is already lost. And if they have any brains that are still functioning, they would do well immediately to shoot up a flag of surrender. But instead, you see, we act as if we're the ones in danger, as if we're the ones uh, that are going to have to surrender. Indeed, multitudes among us have already surrendered to the world. They haven't all abandoned their religious profession. But they certainly are not victors with Christ in this conflict. Now, I'm saying to you that at the very heart of revival is the conviction that revival indeed will happen again and again and again until the very end. And I believe we do God a grave injustice when we act as if it is too late for any mighty acts of God to happen again. Notice verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Spurgeon summarized the verse by saying, God's anointed is appointed and shall not be disappointed. Now look at the next statement. Verse 8, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. I said to you already, this is a messianic psalm. The way it is quoted in the New Testament makes it abundantly clear that that is true. Have you ever sat seriously and quietly before God and contemplated the possibility of Christ being cheated out of his inheritance? You may think you have an inheritance coming in this life, and indeed some wicked stepmother may get it all. 
but Christ will not lose his inheritance. He is invited in this psalm to ask the Father and to set in front of the Father what he wants. Ask of me, verse 8. If you want the heathen for your inheritance, if you want the uttermost part of the earth as your possession, you ask it of me. Do you think the Savior ever asked for the heathen as his inheritance and for the ends of the earth as his possession? I say absolutely he did. When we were instructed last evening to pray in the pattern of the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Were we not part and parcel of the conviction that the inheritance of our Lord Jesus Christ has as its principal parts the utmost part of the earth as his possession and the heathen themselves as his inheritance. But is he getting that today? Well, not like he deserves. Not like he's been promised. Because we've contented ourselves as a church with an awful lot less than God intended his son should have. We've, some of us right here, I dare to say, have had as the most eloquent heart cry, oh God, take me out of this mess. All around me is wickedness and confusion. Just hurry up and come and deliver me from all the sordidness of the earth. Well, that's pretty self-centered. And when you reflect upon the Father having offered the Son as his inheritance, the heathen, and as his possession, the uttermost part of the earth, you ought to ditch all those selfish prayers of escapism. You ought to lay aside forever all pessimistic views and you ought to say, we have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this to see our Savior triumph in the midst of these oppressive and wicked people. I'm really asking the question, is revival a realistic possibility? Have we any solid biblical grounds on which to beseech God to move in a powerful way. And I say to you, absolutely. I tell you one of the most encouraging things that anyone here could do would be to acquaint themselves with the great literature of the church during the 1500s, the 1600s, and the 1700s where a view that was full of hope was demonstrated. Why were revivals so common in those years? Why the men and the women of those days believed that Christ was to have as his inheritance the heathen and the ends of the earth, his possession. But now we're ready to surrender that to Satan. And we live for the most part as if God ought to be satisfied with what he's given to the Son. He can't hope for any more in these last days. God forgive your folly in that type of thinking and focus upon the great hope that is set in front of us. Well, stanza one, man against God. Stanza two, God against man, laughing, holding them in derision. Stanza three, God for man. When Christ is offered the heathen for his inheritance, is that not God for man? 
What an incredible thing that millions, even billions of people scattered throughout the earth, multitudes of them who have never even heard the name of Christ are nonetheless to be his inheritance and parts of the world that have long been under the reign of darkness are part of his possession. And the only way this is going to be realized in our day is in a great revival that stirs the church out of its apathy and causes the church to go out triumphantly bringing the message of the cross to the ends of the earth. Let us take a moment on the last three verses, the fourth stanza. Now, therefore, verse 10, O kings, show discernment, or be wise. Now, therefore, O ye kings. Surely part of the message that we need to carry to all of the leaders of the world is God gave you a brain, please use it. You've been acting stupidly. Your conduct has been full of folly. But now act like wise men. Use those wonderful brains that God has given you. Turn them up full volume, listen, take warning. Look again at verse 10. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Be warned. Worship the Lord, verse 11, with reverence. Serve him with fear. Rejoice even with trembling and kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they who put their trust in him. My dear friends, I am deeply agitated in my heart when I think of the multitudes of professed Christians who, in the midst of their fear and pessimism, see no hope of this wicked world coming to Christ. I am disturbed to the core of my being when I listen to many of the spokesmen of the gospel telling us if we want a revival, we just have to get busy and have it. And then I'm likewise distressed when I encounter with frequency the many who are claiming that a noisy meeting full of excitement, shouting, laughing, jumping, and having a good time is revival. No, revival is God in the midst of his people and the whole world bowing down before the throne and acknowledging Jesus Christ is Lord. But I want to introduce a second scripture out of the New Testament, a scripture that seems to me to be absolutely alive with precious hope. It is, I believe, one of the most profound promises of revival to be found anywhere in all the scripture. I make reference to Romans chapter 11. This is a lengthy chapter, but I'm going to read at least a large part of it and men then make an intense focus upon a critical issue. Romans chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. 
for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but it is of works then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears, that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, lest their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles Inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting of the way of them be the reconciling the world, what shall the receiving of them be? but life from the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not thyself against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. 
For if thou were cut off out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sin. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so these also now not believe that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again, for of him and through him and by him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, dear friends, I know that there are many who believe Romans 11 and they've pushed it off into some distant time. You don't have to embrace my viewpoint, but I am responsible before God to preach it as I see it. And I'm telling you, we have not seen a revival for a very long time because we have allowed ourselves to lose sight of our Lord Jesus Christ, the triumphant King, already gathering the nations together as his inheritance and the ends of the earth as his possession. And part of the heart cry for revival that is desperately needed in our land is a heart cry that believes that in our day there can come again such a glorious season of divine blessing that something that has never yet happened in the history of the church will yet happen. Never, never has the Jew been provoked to such jealousy by the Gentile church that the Jews have come flocking to Christ. And yet that's the promise of Romans 11. I, in my entire life experience, can only recall one conversation with a Jew on matters relevant to what I've been saying. It was rather an astonishing week. I had left Chicago early in the week and gone to California, spent three days in California then flew from California to Brooklyn, where I spent the rest of the week. When I boarded the plane in California for the trip to New York, I saw an older couple coming down the aisle, 
and it appeared to me that they were staring at me. They came along beside me and they said, we've been studying you as we came down the aisle. You're a Christian, aren't you? In astonishment, I acknowledged that indeed, by God's grace, I was. They said, we thought so. It was written all over your countenance. We went on to New York, I wondering. That night, I had dinner in a restaurant with a Jew in Brooklyn. I sought to speak to him about the Messiah. And he turned on me and he said, I do not believe there's a godly person anywhere among the Gentiles. I want you to know that I hold you in utter contempt as a professed Christian. And I thought, what a curious day. How do you put the two together? But dear friends, there was stirred up at my, that time a longing in my heart for such an expression of love to Jesus Christ and faith that the Jew would be provoked to jealousy and would come flocking to Christ saying it's not fair that a blessing originally given us should now be there so exclusively. We insist on being in on this great blessing. And I believe that the heart cry for revival includes a prayer of such depth and earnestness and consequence that its very heart is a yearning that the Gentile church will become so truly godly and Christ-like and filled with the blessings of our Father in heaven, that the Jew will say, we must get in on that blessing. Is it happening in your life? Is it happening in your church? Is your heart this morning full of hope that indeed the whole world will bow before our Savior or have you been content to leave that for some future age? I then suppose that if your understanding of these things is what I consider erroneous, that my few words are going to change your mind. that I do have the right and indeed it is necessary for me to remind you that our fathers saw great revival because they believed that the whole earth was to bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and they prayed with that kind of a heart I would urge you to go back and to see where the church was in the glorious days of reformation and revival and to ask God if he will not give you a heart that believes that Christ is to have the heathen for his inheritance and the utmost part of the earth as his possession and the Jew to be bowed in submission to our Lord Jesus Christ and in love with him because the Gentile church is so aflame with the glory of God that the Jews must get in on the blessing. Lord, you know the backgrounds from which we come. You know those who find ready agreement with what has been offered in this hour and those who must indeed struggle inwardly with it. Our burden is not that one man's will prevails, but that the will 
of our God and Father prevail. I ask, Lord, that you will so dispose our hearts that no matter what our convictions about eschatology, fresh hope will grip us and we will begin to have a heart cry for revival that the earth needs. Give to each of us a quiet and a calm heart that is set upon the determination to allow the Spirit of God to so move and work that revival may come again in our generation. And we believe that at the very heart of all true praying for revival is your glory. And we grieve, we moan within our hearts, we feel agony that you're robbed of your glory by a church that wallows in defeat. So come among us in ways where the glory will be everlastingly thine through Jesus Christ our Lord.